So what was your best investment in the crypto space so far and why? Bitcoin by far, but I was also, uh, again, fortunate to be early in, in uh, Ethereum and Binance and Quantum and, and Block One. Every blockchain is basically a vending machine that requires a token for a service. What's up, everyone? I'm your host, Giovanni. Today, I'm joined by Matthew Rozak, venture capitalist and technology entrepreneur. How are you doing, Matthew? Hey, Giovanni. Good to uh, meet you. and Thanks for having me. Cool. So talking about investing, uh, you are known for having sponsored over 40 dinners in the crypto space, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in steaks and wine. Was that investment worth it? Well, I'm a, I'm a foodie, uh, so I love uh, going to uh, new uh, restaurants, trying new food in wherever, whatever city I'm in. And so in the early days of crypto, uh, you know, we would go to conferences. You know, that's where everybody hung out. And usually these conferences, they were uh, the, the speakers that were on stage were the same people that were in the audience. So they were very small conferences. It was like a lot of the same people. And then we went out for dinner and the dinners were pretty cool because, uh, again, you got to learn, you know, you built this network and you're like, you know, how does, you know, Bitcoin work? Tell me how, you know, what Bitcoin means to you in your words. And you start, you know, building this um, kind of uh, mental model on how to look at things. Uh, but these dinners were pretty, pretty uh, uh, interesting in terms of who showed up. I mean, these, you know, the first dinner was in 2013. First dinner that I uh, had was, you know, I had CZ at it, Charlie Lee from Litecoin, Jesse from Kraken, Bobby Lee from BTC China, uh, Brock Pierce, uh, just so many people back then that uh, a lot of us, you know, had this co compass in our, in our heads that like, this is the right place, the right time, the right room to be in. And we're still figuring it out now. Was it know, in San Francisco? Uh, it was all over. So, you know, San Francisco, Berlin, Las Vegas, Amsterdam, Miami, uh, New York, Chicago. Uh, the, the Berlin one is interesting because it was the conference after Miami. And in Miami was the conference where Vitalik came out with the white paper. This was in uh, 2015 came out with the white paper. So he was walking around the conference with, uh, you know, these photocopied, you know, papers, everybody had Ethereum shirts and everybody's like, you know, what's going on? And then like a week or two later in Berlin, I uh, had a dinner and uh, there was like 20 people that showed up um, at the dinner. And then I think the Ethereum guys heard about it and like another 30 people showed up. And if you, if you come to one of my dinners, you're always going to be fed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're always going to be invited. And so I, I begged the uh, restaurant to make room and accommodate for all these early Ethereum enthusiasts. But again, it was fortuitous and fortunate because then I was like, well, what's this Ether Ethereum thing? And I got to learn about it and be uh, kind of exposed to that uh, early on. And so, so again, the, the dinners were a hack for me. It was a life hack uh, to learn more, to network more, and to, to really understand how this uh, industry lived and breathed and worked and, uh, uh, and kind of developing, again, those mental models on, on where, where this is all going. So it was, and there were a lot of fun too. So what was your best investment in the crypto space so far and why? Great question. I mean, I, I, again, I was fortunate to be um, early in this space. And so Bitcoin certainly has been uh, an amazing um, asset and and we all know it's been the best performing asset over the last 10 years and and so bitcoin by far but i was also uh again fortunate to be early in in uh, ethereum and binance and quantum and and block one and and a lot of these things not that at that moment uh mind you i i thought that oh this is going to be the ethereum killer or this is going to be the next uh xyz it was you know uh, the people, the relationship, the the uh, the friendship at that point, um, uh, and trying to help somebody build something was the premise at the time. And certainly, looking back on it, you know, there's a lot of missed opportunities uh, as well uh, that uh, that were out there because the, the, the back in the 17, uh, 16, 17, 18 timeframe, there's just a lot of deals, uh, and a lot of deals were done quickly and almost defied venture instincts, you know, where 
uh, one of the deals I invested in, um, they didn't even have a pitch deck. And it was literally the first time in my life I invested into a company without a pitch deck. Not that the pitch deck is everything, but I didn't even have that. And then, you know, it gets to a point where people are um, trying to do and close deals, not in weeks and months, but in hours and days. And that was also unique and kind of uh, unsettling. Uh, and then it kind of turned normal, which was, it's kind of strange. And now, you know, the market's gone, we've gone through a crypto winter. We've, we've kind of gone through some machinations in the space. And, you know, the, the economic dynamics of, of where we all are sitting today, I think a lot of that diligence, a lot of those um, things to better align projects and teams and investors uh, is improving, getting healthier. Uh, but uh, back in the day, that was kind of kind of surreal. Uh, but today I, I spend all my time, energy and money uh, building and investing in block. Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask you right now. Uh, what kind of projects are in your radar, like in terms of projects you, your, your company would like to invest into? If you had to mention uh, specific, uh, mm, specific use cases of, uh, of blockchain. So you're uh, talking about from the investment side and not the block building side. Now, yeah, I'm talking about the investment side. So on the investment side, I, I, I do like DeFi a lot and seeing how... Um, I mean, fundamentally, you know, we, we all work hard for our money and money should now work hard for us. So if you have value, um, I, I think where DeFi will go is, is basically put your, your value, your assets on a treadmill. And that treadmill will optimize uh, and get the best return uh, for that moment in time. So having algorithms to say, well, you should lend it out, you should invest it in this and have uh, software smarts uh, do that uh, for you versus, you know, listening to a human or some, you know, uh, research report from somebody uh, that's biased or what, what have you, but having algorithms to really uh, manage your money. And I think the, the uh, Lego bricks of, of DeFi, you know, lending, investing and, and all the um, kind of fractional tokenized ownership of things and being able to do that on a, on a liquid basis, on a, uh, on a smart basis where, again, your money is always on a treadmill. You know, you, you work hard for your money, your money sh should work hard for you. In a recent presentation, you said that mining is a street fight. It is about brute force. So what exactly do you mean by saying that mining is uh, equivalent to brute force? And uh, how do you plan or you think it can be improved? Well, I don't think it's a brute force relative to, uh, you know, trying to crack SHA-256, but it's, it's, uh, the reality is mining has gotten very sophisticated. It, it is, it is, uh, very difficult to be a hobbyist miner today, uh, especially at the Bitcoin level. And so the sophistication is of consequence. People back in the day were saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, the best way to figure out if you're making money is to look at your power bill and look at your Bitcoin balance and see if you're you're making money. Uh, those days are are long gone. Um, a lot of these industrial miners um, have real um, challenges in their business between uh, sourcing uh, miners, getting capital for miners. That's a very capital intensive business and a treadmill that you need to stay on for uh for a while and so you know the capital to to be a miner the devices and then the management to, to effectively manage uh that mining farm uh it's it's hard to do that with homegrown software uh back in the day early days of mining people would just say you know um giovanni stand uh in the middle of this uh facility and if you see a red light call me <laughs> you know it was like that uh, and so it's gotten very sophisticated in terms of procurement, financing, operations. And then there's the whole treasury management piece to say, well, I got the money. I got the miners. I uh, burnished the Bitcoin. Now what do I do with it? OTC, trade it, lend it, you know, custody it. And the whole financial services around mining have gotten more sophisticated as well. So. Uh, it is a much more brutal business. Uh, it's gotten um, 
to a point where you need to be more sophisticated in how you operate as, as a miner. So I would just want to mention um, one of the core mission that uh, the block has, which is creating a world where uh, there are multiple blockchains, multiple tokens, and uh, all of them are interacting with each other. I think the right term would be interoperability. So why do you think the world needs multiple blockchain and multiple tokens? Um, I would love for there just to be one uh, blockchain, one protocol, and have a TCP IP uh, get um, birthed from this uh, sector. I think the reality is there will be multiple blockchains and, and different um, railroads that have to integrate. Um, we're not starting with interoperability. We're, we're understanding that there's going to be this uh, internet of blockchains, this this, this uh forest of chains. And so for a user, a developer, uh, et cetera, you need to kind of simplify that. So, so um, another way to look at it, Giovanni, is, is um, every blockchain is basically a vending machine that requires a token for a service. If I want uh, storage, I go to Filecoin to get the the, the Filecoin um, service, I need to deposit a token to get that service. And so these vending machines for whether it's DeFi and you're looking at lending, investing and yield and all these other um, uh, legal blocks of DeFi, uh, you need to create a provisioning engine that will determine what to do. Uh, same thing with Web3 and the kind of the new internet where you're looking at storage and uh, access database, um, uh, compute, uh, all these different things that compose what AWS is today, the, the crypto industry is building. And it's a lot bigger opportunity because you're just assembling and provisioning resources. And so, so Block's thesis is, is to build that provisioning engine uh, for all these different uh, vending machines that need that service. And one of the first Use cases where we're uh, targeting is uh, Web3, where, you know, it's not Amazon Web Services, it's decentralized web services. So if I need a, a decentralized web server, um, you know, I need, you know, I'll just say I need compute and storage. Well, for compute, am I going to go to Gollum for storage? Am I going to go to Sia, Filecoin, Gennaro, storage, uh, what have you? As a developer or as a machine, because uh, so, uh, at some point machines are going to be provisioning this, I don't want to go through all those different um, uh, protocols and determine which one. I want an engine, a smart engine that will say, provision compute for me based on these parameters of security, cost, and time, or whatever else I program in there and say go. Uh, that's a lot better experience uh, against this forest of blockchains that are out there. And so we're trying to simplify that. And, you know, what, what Amazon did for the internet 20 years ago, and they did that out of just, you know, a, a need for themselves because they didn't find the experience, uh, very good in terms of scaling their data centers. Um, and, and they did that in the old fashioned way. We have to lease space. We have to buy servers. We have to connect it. We have to manage it, et cetera. Um, the Amazon of the future is going to be software where, uh, you know, Amazon is the biggest. They're, they're three times bigger than Google, uh, Azure and IBM's public cloud. But then look at all the other compute resources or storage resources that are out there, uh, in the world. And that's, that's a bigger provisioning game. It's not a real estate game or a procurement of Dell servers. It is a, a provisioning game to say, how do I incentivize, you know, if I'm Filecoin, Sia, et cetera, how do I incentivize people to give me some of their uh, storage or some of their compute? Uh, and then uh, to assemble all that, because I only I don't only need storage, I also need storage, compute, and all these other things. Um, Block wants to be the uh, assembly piece for that. And so that provisioning and the smarts to provision is very hard. Uh, but it's also going to be very uh, useful and will help this uh, this industry scale. It's, it's what AWS did. It's, in many ways, it's what Twilio did uh, to uh, for a lot of the, the uh, kind of notifications uh, in in uh, uh, the kind of internet experience. So 
there's there's a lot of those commonalities uh, from the early internet uh, that we saw uh, to the early kind of blockchain space that we're we're currently in. Can you maybe just shortly simplify a little bit this uh, analogy that you made with uh, with with Amazon? Because that that sounded interesting, but I'm not sure I quite understand it. Like uh, you you talked about an Amazon of the future, so. How do you see uh, this Amazon of the future um, and the, how that Amazon of the future is related to the offer that uh, Block uh, offers? So uh, I view the Amazon of the future to be Block. Uh, that, that's what, where I think, uh, uh, what, what, again, Amazon did for the, for the internet and getting, getting a developer Uh, to literally with AWS, this is, I'm talking about Amazon Web Services, not the, you know, the uh, books and grocery marketplace, but Amazon Web Services, uh, you know, 20 years ago, it was a huge friction and huge pain to provision your own uh, um, and host your own servers um, and, and uh, configure your servers and all that complexity was compressed to say, well, you know, just get that service in the cloud by Amazon and Amazon will provide you all the uh, redundancy, all the provisioning of those uh, services uh, on a monthly basis. And so they made this complex thing to say, Giovanni, let's build this software. Geez, we need to have a, a DevOps person that's going to manage the servers and host this and, and kind of figure out what the database has got to be and all these complexities and now it's basically a service and so they, they did a good job of compressing all that complexity into one service uh, on one platform block is it, uh, sees the same thing where uh, you know there's all this complexity in blockchain and to, to, to get all that put together it's really hard even for the best developers it's really difficult in this space and there's a lot of friction there unnecessarily and so we want to take a lot of those uh, and whether you know and you could do this uh and compose these lego blocks in a certain way whether it's for DeFi or web3 or other areas in crypto uh we're focused on web3 which basically means amazon web services and so being able to provide that um One service, many networks, is very powerful and is even more powerful in, in crypto because of the way in which uh, it all works. Um, but it's, it's, uh, that's, that's the vision for what we're trying to build towards. That was venture capitalist Matthew Rozak. I'm Giovanni, your host. If you enjoyed the interview, smash the like button and subscribe. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe and hodl.